Hello and welcome to New Central Television. I am Dagbo Adigboye, the top stories at this hour. Please beef up security ahead as Easter celebration kicks off. Transmission Company of Nigeria successfully restores power greed. Divergent views greet Togo's new constitution. Details in a moment. Let's begin by telling you that the traditional ruler of Ewu Orobo Kingdom, Ugele South Local Government Area of Delta State, Southern Nigeria, Clement Ikolo, who voluntarily surrendered himself on Thursday evening, has been flown to Abuja. He is one of the eight persons declared wanted by the defense headquarters following the killing of 17 soldiers in an ambush in Okwama community within the kingdom. He was escorted to the Asaba airport by both the commanding officer, 63 Brigade, Nigerian Army Asaba, the Delta State Police Commissioner, and other senior military officers. Since his arrival in Abuja, information about his engagement with the military investigators has been scarce. The monarch had on Thursday pleaded his innocence in a filmed interview before turning himself in to the police. In the meantime, the storm triggered by the killing of the 17 soldiers may not be settling soon, as residents of the neighboring communities to Okwama have, torch, have lost torch with peace owing to the heavy presence of military personnel around them. Now, New Central's correspondent, Austin Azu, visited the areas and brings us these details. Oto Ewo is the traditional headquarters of Ewo Kingdom in Ogele South local government area of Delta State. A Kwama community where 17 soldiers were ambushed and killed is under this kingdom. The Nigeria Army authorities have shown readiness and determination to get those behind the killing of the soldiers. This is convincingly responsible for continuous invasion of neighboring communities and beyond in search of the suspects. The next thing I saw, I saw many of them, they were just parading the old places. They started breaking doors. What has become evident is that some mistakes may have been made in identifying targets. And those who bear the brunt of this cannot hide their frustration. If the soldiers depart, they pray, they make us they fear, they make us they run. No matter they fight the fight like that, so we know they okay. So people be running up and down, running here, running, running here. So they're not they comfortable. And along the line, when the soldiers come, go to Aramare and Orere. People have more fear. Say, ah, the people are becoming, you know, they want to fight us. I mean, what is happening? So many people hide, hang around. So nobody gets joy from now. So I beg, we need peace. That is what we are crying for, for the wicked on here. The fact that people are fighting all over there, people are suffering. They are suffering, mostly with the children and the wives. Food, no food to eat, nothing to, to, to help them. So we want the governor to go and help them. But this Ninja Delta youth leader wished the soldiers would be more accurate in hunting down their targets in order to reduce the collateral damage arising from the operation. They have to work with citizens closely to liaise with the grassroots to get information, to get intake, so that those bad heads will be fished out. And I will strongly advise the military to investigate properly before going for oppression or invasion. The monarch of Ewo Kingdom, who was one of the eight persons declared wanted by the defense headquarters, pleaded his innocence and handed himself over to security agencies. Coming days remain crucial as the search of the suspects continue, and the army strives to solve the puzzle of whom we are responsible for the death of the soldiers. Perhaps that's when the people bearing the brunt of acts they knew nothing about will find peace. In a war kingdom, Delta State, I'm Austin Azu. The Transmission Company of Nigeria says it has successfully restored the national power greed following its collapse at 4.28 p.m. on Thursday. TCN, in a statement on Friday, said the greed attained full recovery by 10 p.m. on the same day. However, the Eco Electricity Distribution Company said on Friday that it was able to receive minimal power supply from the greed to put Agbara, Ojo, Akangba, Aja, Leki, and Alagbon transmission stations on supply. 
On Thursday, major cities, including Lagos and Abuja, were thrown into darkness following the collapse of the national grid. We'll go on a quick break. When we return, we have more stories. Stay with us. We're still watching News Central now. Now, to discuss the fallout of the killings in uh, Okuama, I'm joined by the convener and CEO, Alternative Approach to the Development of the Niger Delta, uh, Sleek O'Hare. Thank you for your time. Yeah, welcome, everybody. All right. Now, the wanted Murnak has uh, now been handed over to uh, the military for further investigation and questioning into the killings of these soldiers. Do you think others on the wanted list would do the same? Yes, I think they would do the same uh, if they are sure that uh, they will be fairly and uh, humanly handled or treated. They will surrender because uh, I would advise for any person, but I will, I will, I will have some confidence to say that uh, uh, they may not have anything to do with uh, the unfortunate situation that happened there. The ones that may not have, uh, may not surrender themselves will be the one who think they have questions to answer, but I'm confident they will handle that. They will surrender themselves. Uh, they are not doing so now. And of course, the traditional law has pointed out himself and he has made itself clear that they have nothing to do with what happened there. Uh, I think they will surrender as soon as they are assured of their safety and uh, fair handling, fair treatment. Yes, they will. All right. Now, I mean, it has to be asked, I mean, however, but uh, why did the army declare an accessible man wanted? Uh, do you think this was actually necessary? Uh, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's necessary, but I cannot uh, speak for the army. Cannot mm. speak for the military. I don't think it's uh, proper. But they they were they could they probably have uh, asked the police to invite him for a little questioning. And of course, I think it's in a place where they can easily reach to ask a question. But I can't speak for the army. Uh, they could do better. But for sure, for sure, for very sure, they could do better. Now, reports are actually also filtering in that the town is now some sort of a ghost town as people have fled into the bushes uh, with many relating the situation to what happened in Odi. That's by Yelsa State so many years ago. Now, despite the assurances from the government, people aren't returning back to the community. We actually did a, you know, a report on that. Now, what's your analysis here? Yeah, I, I don't think the town, that Tukama community exists anymore. That's the name. Uh, if the people need to return, uh, who, who, what are they returning to in the first place? They don't have any houses uh, to go into. So if they have to come back, which they should, uh, the whole country, we all should join hand in helping their own. But first, we give them, even, even if temporary accommodation, we need a temporary accommodation, we need to a registration of fear from them so that even when they want to sleep at night, with all the pains in their body, they can still sleep at night. They should return. We should also make sure that when they return, there should be some food to eat, no matter how uh, wretched that food is. But none of those things are existing now. And with the presence of the military there, the fears are still there, uh, the pains are still there. So the town is only existing in name only because there's nothing there mm. for them now, to return. But they should be encouraged to return. Okay. Now, and just before everybody should join hand to, uh, to assist them to return, so that uh, within a few weeks, a few months time, they can start their normal life again. Those who are survived, they can start their normal life again. But for now, the town exists only in name. Now, just before I let you go, what would be your advice to the army, you know, as regards their investigation, and what do you also suggest can be done to address the root cause of this, to avert situations like this in the future? Uh, well, first of all, the, what led to this is a clash between uh, uh, two communities over land, uh, over land uh, boundary. And uh, it wasn't f fully for the two communities, it was for a family in one community versus another family in another community that spread over the community and the crisis. So if to avoid this future, any land uh, dispute, any land clash, that take place should be handled by the local government, 
by the state and by the police. Even if the clashes become a bit violent and bloody, the police should be the, uh, the records for such a situation to avoid uh, uncontrolled damages and losses of life. Slick Oshare, thank you so much for your time. A convener and CEO alternative approach to the development of the Niger Delta. Once again, thank you, sir. You are welcome. Now, let's uh, also tell you that all banks in Nigeria have been given a directive to recapitalize within the next 24 months and should present an implementation plan of how it will achieve this to the Central Bank of Nigeria before April 30th. A statement signed by the Director, Financial Policy and Regulations Department of the Apex Bank, Haruna Mustafa, disclosed the minimum capital base for a commercial bank with international authorization will now be 500 billion naira. For commercial banks with national authorization, the capital base will be 200 billion naira, while regional banks are expected to build their capital base to 50 billion naira. CBN also pegged the new capital base for merchant banks at 50 billion naira, while the non-interest banks with na national authorization should improve to 20 billion naira capital base. Those with regional authorization should have a minimum of 10 billion naira capital base. Now joining me on the news to discuss this is research and insight associate Nuren Berger. That's Simon Oyekami. Thank you for your time. Now with this new directive, with uh, I mean, will all these banks be able to meet up with the CBN's demands? Yeah, thank you very much and, and good morning. Uh, I, I think it's it's a quite dicey question um, because when you look at the share capital base of most of these banks, you see that many of them are largely lagging, um, especially for those ones that needs to meet about 500 or 200 um, billion uh, in the next um, two years. But it is not impossible because then again, there are options for them. So if you know, um, notice in the last um, last month, we've seen some of those banks um, come to the uh, Nigerian stock market to raise some form of funding. Um, either through some rights issues or some form of um, um, shares issues. I think it, it is it is possible for a larger portion of um, these banks to be able to recapitalize and meet up with the two-year deadline. Uh, however, for some of those banks that might be um, quite low, uh, look at the likes of um, um, Sterling Bank, for example, shares capital uh, less than 60 billion, uh, um, you might be having some issues around there. But but then again, I, I feel it is possible 24 24 months, a lot can be done. Uh, and um, the Nigerian stock market uh, has proven to be uh, um, uh, a possible place where um, fundings can be raised. The market is really doing well. And I feel um, the positive sentiment around that is going to help also um, spur some level of positive sentiment from uh, on the side of investors who want to move their monies in there. But time will only tell. I, I feel it's quite possible. All right. Now, for commercial banks, the capital base will be 200 billion naira, while regional banks are expected to build their capital base to, you know, about 50 billion naira. How possible is this, given the scale of these banks? Yes, like I said, uh, it, it's possible. Uh, and then the CBN had also gone as far as giving them uh, um, options by which they can use, um, where they can, uh, what forms by which they can raise capital. Or, of course, the downside is that they don't have access to their retained earnings, which if they had, would have um, made sure that a, a number of them, almost every one of them, would be able to meet up with their recapitalization of either 200 billion or 500 billion, um, depending on, on well, what category of banks or um, institutions that they are. But is it possible? Yes, it is mm. possible. And in situation whereby it is not possible, we might be seeing some form of mergers. Don't forget that in, in the Sanusi era, too, we had um, such form of recapitalization where um, some banks have to merge to become stronger, and uh, that that is expected to, to happen if many of them are not able to raise capital. Because of course, when you look at um, the sum based on just quoted banks alone, we might be expecting them to raise at least a minimum of two trillion naira uh, in 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 about two years. That's a huge amount of money if you have to raise those fundings um, from um, the Nigerian market alone. And considering the fact that. Um, it's the banking sector, it's quite sensitive. So there's going to be a whole lot of due diligence, a whole lot of capitals will be 
turn, we turn back because um, you don't want illicit funding finding themselves into the financial system. So it, it can be hard, but it, it is possible, especially for the larger banks, because they have a track record and um, investors would, 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 would be willing to put their money into such banks. But for the smaller banks, you might be seeing some form of acquisition. The bigger banks might have to buy um, some of those smaller ones. You might be seeing some of the banks also downgrading themselves either to fit into the uh, regional um, um, category or, uh, and, so, and so on. Okay, and before I let you go, I mean, you just uh, sort of, uh, you know, nosedived into my next question, talking about the ripple effect of this particular policy on the banking sector. In this particular areas, consumer deposit, that's customer deposit, people's money in the banks, people that, you know, have loans with the banks in terms of interest uh, rates, and also employees in that sector. What becomes of them? Um, if for anything in recent time, um, what we have learned in the Nigerian market is that acquisition or a merger does not necessarily mean that employees will suffer. In fact, business goes, um, goes um, almost a, a, as usual. Because then again, the banks also want to be able to boast of huge um, asset base. So if you look at the likes of Access, Access Bank or now Access Holdings, most of the acquisitions over the years, they've retained those, those assets and their employees. And that has made them, I think, the largest bank right now in terms of assets. Now, if, I think there are a lot of positives also, because if you look at the banking sector, um, in terms of nominal value accounts for, I think, less than 4% of the um, national GDP. So you want your banking sector to, to be robust enough to be able to carry every other sector on their back in terms of um, giving loans. And you, again, look at the banks. They've been putting in, been investing in some very um, sensitive and volatile instruments. Don't forget that just not quite long ago, the CBN, um, place they ban on their NOP positions. And of course, FX markets, highly volatile. So because of those kind of investment that could have a uh, ripple effect on the banking industry, there's need for them to shore up their capital base in order to be able to um, hold um, still in, uh, in times um, when, when necessary. But of course, I think the CBN has tried to cover most of the bases in, in, in such that the banks remain resilient. I do not see it having any ripple effect in terms of um, bank, um, customer loans or deposits or in terms of employees. If there's going to be anything, it's going to be that um, some bigger banks might have to swallow some smaller ones. Some two smaller banks or average big medium banks might have to come together to form bigger banks in order to show up their capital or some form of downgrade. By the end of the day, what we would notice is that we'll have maybe a less number of banks but with bigger capital base and um, we have the level of competitiveness that you want um, the banks in a country like Nigeria, it will boast to be um, one of the largest economies in Africa to, to have and to be able to, um, you know, compete far as far with bigger banks in Africa like those in, in South Africa and some other countries in the world. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Samuel Oyekomi, Research and Insight Associate, Noren Berger. Once again, thank you. Nigeria's uh, telecom market is one of Africa's largest and fastest growing markets. Now, while the sector has improved in leaps and bounds, there are still many areas to be improved upon, such as in the area of broadband penetration. In this report, New Central's Bettina Mwili takes a look at how the sector has fared in the first quarter of 2024. On March 14, 2024, Nigeria woke up to restricted internet access. The disruption, which also affected several other countries, was said to have resulted from a cut on the submarine cable system offshore the coast of West Africa. The magnitude and cost implications of the service disruption threw up the need for Nigeria to seek and invest in alternative solutions to prevent a repeat incidence. We have become uh, very virtual, we've been very internet reliant in all of our activities across board and that has really, really affected lives. I do not think uh, we should at this point uh, give in to this conspiracy theory and it affects life in no small measure. Banks, financial transactions, business transactions, e-commerce and all the uh, e-commerce activities across the, the West African sub-region. Telecom's equipment is mostly imported into the country 
and the recent downward spiral of the Naira against the dollar has seen the cost of many infrastructural projects in the spike. This has impacted the rollout of 5G services, which requires massive investments in infrastructure to make the service go around the country and to provide quality service. But how much has the emergence of 5G network improved connectivity? We have experiences where the people will go and put the fiber and hide by the bush. When the operators go for repair, they kidnap them, they hold them and rob them of their uh, barriers. Things like that, there are in, in, in the south, south in particular, there are places like in River State where they will call MTL, please, I am in your manhole so-so location. Come and meet me or I'm going to cut the fire. And you have to go and settle them. In the area of security, telecommunication has to a large extent been used by nefarious elements to perpetrate various crimes such as kidnappings, banditry, terrorism, and the national identity number, NIN, was supposed to help check this. According to the National Identification Management Commission, NIMSI, the NIN would help sync all records about a person in the database and prevent both double identity and identity fraud. The question now is why is insecurity still the order of the day, with millions of Nigerians already registered with their NIN? Those umbrella people that have been engaged by the mobile network operators that you see outside, they do not do their same registration with due diligence. Some of them, the moment they say, um, sorry, um, what is your mother's maiden name? This is one of the questions. Or what local government do you come from? Ah, which one? I don't know. I only know my state. I don't know the name. And then they will go on because they want the numbers. They will now go on to register them, despite that they did not give complete information. There is no gain saying that the telecom sector has impacted on the Nigerian economy in several positive ways. However, there is a consensus that more ground still need to be covered to attain the desired results. And with more investments in the telecom sector, this desired result will be achieved sooner than later. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Unwili. Developed maritime nations of the world attain success in shipping by protecting local operators. In Nigeria, statistics show that over 20,000 ships work for the oil and gas sector on Nigeria's waters with an annual expenditure of over $600 million in the upstream sector alone. With this poor participation, the federal government of Nigeria came up with the cabotage law in the maritime industry and the local content policy in the oil and gas sector to tackle this challenge. Yet, implementation or political will has endured the almost death of Nigeria's shipping sector. The act is very clear in terms of um, functions okay. and the Honorable Minister of Transportation is the, uh, uh, the main uh, uh, authority of the implementation of the Cabotage Act. So today there's the Minister of Ministry, Federal Ministry of Marine and Blue Economy. First thing that must be done, legislate, le legislative amendments to the Cabotage Act okay. to remove the function of the Transport. Minister of Transportation and give that function to the, the Minister of uh, uh, Marine and Blue Economy. That's number one. Number two is to revisit the reason why and strategies towards why Nigeria is not on the IMO whitelist. And number three, everything possible to get Nigeria back on the IMO Council. To me, those are the first three objectives that must be achieved within a very short space of time. Find out more about the impact of Nigerian Content Development and Monitoring Board in the development of indigenous participation in Nigeria's oil and gas sector. Watch Maritime Radar on Saturday 7 p.m. and a repeat broadcast on Sunday, that's 1 p.m. on News Central. Now let's also tell you on the news that Nigeria's federal government has assured citizens of its commitment to allow press freedom in the country. This was made known by the nation's Minister of Information and National Orientation as he received senior executives of the Center for Media and Society 
in Abuja. Amadun Uyi tells us more. The team had visited from the Center for Media and Society in Abuja. After commending the Minister of Information and National Orientation for visible reforms in the ministry and amongst its agencies, they made several key demands, including creating a conducive environment for the press to thrive by pushing for amendment of available laws relating to press freedom. We request that you also push for amendment of section 39, which provides for freedom of expression, to include specifically, why that section remains, but to include specifically freedom of the press. This has come from the challenges we have seen even in the courts, that what we have in section 39 is a right you know, that goes to all citizens and does not specifically, not specifically for the press. Honorable Minister, sir, colonial era laws such as those on sedition and criminal defamation should be removed from the static books. They have no place in today's international standards. Indeed, the court, or since 1982, the Court of Appeal already expunged, already struck the laws of sedition dead. But it remains in our statute books, and no efforts has been made you know, to remove it from there. The Minister of Information and National Orientation assured them of government's commitment to ensure press freedom in the country. I want to reiterate the commitment of government to ensure that there is press freedom in this country. Uh, the press is even freer. But like I always say, uh, freedom is not free if it doesn't have responsibility. So as you have press freedom, you also have responsibility. He says President Bola Tinubu has given his word to Nigerians and will not renege on his promises. His message consistently to Nigerians is that uh, uh, everyone will breathe. The poor, the rich, everyone will have to breathe. And it is the media that will create that env environment uh, for that uh, uh, freedom to, to... The minister, however, urged citizens and members of the press to practice their profession responsibly. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. As Nigeria joined other countries of the world to mark Good Friday and begin the Easter festivities, security agencies have beefed up security in different parts of the country to forestall unsavory incidents. The Nigeria Police Force, the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, the Military, Department of State Service, and the Federal Road Safety Corps heightened a security surveillance a nationwide and also deployed key personnel in strategic locations, including worship centers, shopping malls, amusement parks, and recreational centers. The DSS urged Nigerians to remain vigilant throughout the Easter period and advised them to report attempts by criminals to perpetrate crimes during the celebrations. The effect of the harsh economic realities on people in Nigeria seems to linger, even as the country's currency is recovering in the foreign exchange market. Now, New Central's Chizaba Anyongwe was at the Taminus main market in Jos Plateau State, where she felt the pulse of the people on the cost of living as the Easter celebration kicks in. It is less than 48 hours to the celebration of Easter which marks the resurrection of Jesus Christ in line with the Christian faith. Since the removal of subsidy on petrol by Nigeria's federal government in May last year, life has become some sort of a struggle for many people. The high cost of goods, particularly food items, is no longer news as citizens on the plateau bear their hearts comparing the situation with what it used to be months ago. I see this basket now, 10.5. I buy them today. How much I go sell them? Uh, Shombo, the back now, almost 20 something thousand. Pepe, almost 40,000. One, one, uh, one back, almost 40,000. Would they sell, no, they come out. You know, since I was born, I've not seen, you know, the, this kind of situation. The, the price is out of control. And the government is not doing anything about it. This government made a help us for this our Nigeria. Like today now, today be Good Friday. I go see different type of foil. I don't see foil buy. Now people want grant, no foil to 
to grab the common man cannot even eat meat what we usually use uh, sorry we usually use 1800 naira to buy package but now today it's about 5000 naira package try to buy fresh fresh fruits or fresh and fresh vegetables in jaws and it's still expensive despite the fact that plant is a very very good place to plant all these things for them if governance is about the people and for the people then Government at all levels need to rise up to their responsibility in soothing their plight. I think the government can step in because there's something we call the price control unit. They said they are not actually active. I think they should step in and work in order to try to bring this thing down because Naira has added value. So we are crying for our governor. Here we are sitting for outside sun and everything. We are looking for money. And we not see the more money. The federal government to intervene on this issue to come and see what is happening today in Nigeria. All people are passing through this increasing of things. They should come out, you know, with a decisive, you know, measure concerning this thing so that humanity can have a sigh of relief. It is two days away from Easter and what people are saying is that everything in the market has just been increasing in prices every other day. What they are asking for is that government should step in to ensure that there's a regulatory agency that will control these prices for the betterment of the masses. In JAWS for New Central, Chizaba Anyoui. Coming up on the news. Different views, Great Togo's new constitution. We have details of this and more after the break. The news continues in West Africa, where residents of Togo's capital, Lome, share opposing views on the country's new constitution, approved by parliament earlier this week, which sets out to switch the West African nation from a presidential to a parliamentary system. On Monday, Parliament almost unanimously adopted a new constitution that ended elections for the country's leader. Instead, the president will now be selected by lawmakers without debate. Critics fear the reform, which was proposed by the ruling party, will allow Nasibe to remain in power indefinitely, though it is unclear when the change will take effect. révision constitutionnelle, puisque les députés, en fait de mandature, n'ont pas le droit de changer la constitution. Ils auraient dû passer par une consultation nationale, selon moi, pour avoir aussi l'avis de la population avant de faire cette, ce changement constitutionnel. Je pense que c'est un coup de force constitutionnelle. Bon, eh, les Kenyans me le font, les, les milieux de Mouya, et de Mouya, là, d'accord, eh, président. president in East Africa, Madagascar's High Court has announced that the Speaker of Parliament, a former supporter of President Andrew Rajolina, turned government critic, has been stripped of a post. The court's decision to remove Christine Raza Namahosa uh, from the National Assembly cited a flagrant violation of her party's line of conduct and the role as Speaker. Just before the first round of presidential elections last November, Raza Namahosa, who was turned into a leading opposition figure, called for the post to be suspended. She was the Justice Minister before being appointed Speaker of the Assembly. For a few months in 2014, the first woman to hold the position. She was re elected Speaker in 2019. A slow moving cyclone that unexpectedly turned towards Madagascar has killed 18 persons, washing away homes and displacing thousands. High winds ripped down trees, and torrents of water gushed through villages after the cyclone, 
which was initially projected to skim the Indian Ocean island, changed course and made landfall in the north on Wednesday. According to statistics released on Friday by the National Risk and Disaster Management Office, more than 20,000 persons have been displaced and over 5,000 households affected. Some victims had drowned, while others were killed by collapsing houses or falling trees. A previous death toll had stood at 11. Still ahead, now six construction workers to be honored in Baltimore Bridge collapse. Of course, we have details of this and more after the break. Members of the Immigrant Advocacy Organization, that's CASA in Maryland, are gathered to honor the six construction workers who lost their lives while working on the uh, Francis Court Key Bridge that collapsed after it was struck by a container ship. Vessel traffic through the busy port of Baltimore had been suspended indefinitely, causing disruptions to trade spanning the globe. We are joined together today for a somber moment of honoring the six brothers who lost their lives during the key bridge collapse this week and the essential workers who performed the dangerous yet critical work of the construction industry. In a country where immigrants are often demonized, from the floor of the General Assembly to the halls of Congress, here, we are reminded once again about the enormous contribution that the immigrants made to this country. How together, we U.S. board workers, we build this country. Let's join our business desk for today's business news. Welcome to Business News. Nigeria is developing new guidelines that will require companies seeking mining licenses to present plans for local mineral processing, according to a government spokesperson, Shegun Tomori. This marks a departure from Nigeria's long-standing policy of exporting raw materials as African governments aim to extract more value from their solid mineral deposits. To attract investment, Nigeria will offer incentives such as tax waivers for importing mining equipment, streamlined processes for securing electricity generation licenses, full repatriation of profits, and enhanced security measures. Tomori emphasized that companies will need to demonstrate their commitment to setting up processing plants and adding value to the Nigerian economy. The guidelines finalization and implementation dates were not specified. The government's objective is to create jobs, support local communities, and maximize the benefits of mineral exploration. To Southern Africa now, South African Reserve Bank reports that the foreign direct investment inflows in South Africa decreased to 16.2 billion rands in the fourth quarter of 2023, down from 26 billion rands in the third quarter. For the entire year of 2023, direct investment inflows amounted to 96.5 billion rands, a decline from 151 billion rands in 2022. This decline was primarily driven by a slowdown in equity investment by foreign parent companies in domestic companies. In terms of portfolio investment, there were smaller outflows of 9 billion rands in the final quarter of 2023 compared to outflows of 41.9 billion rands in the previous quarter. Cumulative portfolio investment outflows for 2023 reached 87.5 billion rands, contrasting with inflows of 42.6 billion rands in 2022. And finally, the United States says it has been maintaining regular communication with Gekka Mines, the Democratic Republic of Congo state miner, in an effort to strengthen relationships with key suppliers of cobalt and copper in Africa. This is according to a senior State Department official. The discussions with Gekka Mines focus on supply agreements and potential mining projects occurring every four to six weeks. 
The Mineral Security Partnership, consisting of multiple countries and the European Union, recently announced a deal with Keke Mines and Japan's JogMEC, resulting from these conversations. The objective is to avoid reliance on a single supplier and promote responsible investment practices that prioritize local workforce and environmental cleanup. The U.S. aims to diversify its supply chains and encourage higher mining standards in Africa rather than counter China's influence. These are the business headlines at Osama. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasome Peter. The news continues shortly. Bye for now. Let's wrap it up with some sporting details. We are Egyptian side Al Ali have recorded a historic 1-0 victory over Tanzanian side Zimba in the first leg of the CAF Champions League quarterfinal fixture to take a valuable win into the second leg on Friday in Cairo. Al Ali, who were without several of its key players, took the lead in the 46th minute, courtesy of a goal from Ahmed Nabil. Uh, the win is Al Ali's first ever in Tanzania against Zimba, who is appearing in the fourth quarterfinal since the competition underwent a format change in 1997. Both teams will now face each other again on Friday in Cairo to determine the team to advance to the semi-finals. Super Eagle striker Emmanuel Dennis, uh, Dennis uh, scored his uh, fourth goal of the season as Watford played out a 2-2 draw against Table Topping Leeds United. Emmanuel leveled the score for Waterfield uh, in the 44th minute, helping Watford pick up a point in Tom Cleverley's first match at Vakarage Road as an interim manager. Watford uh, are, set, are still in search of a first home league win since uh, November 2023 and are seated 14th in the championship table with 49 points just behind Bristol City. Victor Wambayama scored a career-high 40 points and added 20 rebounds and 7 assists as the San Antonio Spores overcame Jalien Brunson's career-best 61 points to beat New York Knicks. That's 130 to 126 in overtime on Friday night. He made a three-point to give San Antonio a four-point lead in overtime, as he had the first of 40 points and 20 rebound game by the rookie since Shaquille O'Neal had 46 points. 21 rebounds on February 16, 1993. With a win over the New York Knicks, San Antonio Spurs have now had their first three games win streak in the NBA this season. And that's a wrap on the news at this time, but before we go, another look at some of our top stories. We told you that police beef up security ahead as Easter celebration kicks off. We also told you that Transmission Company of Nigeria successfully restores power grid. And finally, we told you that Divergent View grid Togo's new constitution. Don't forget to send in your eyewitness reports to the WhatsApp number on the screen. You can also follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and... Thanks for watching. I'm Dapo. I dig for you. Bye for now.